welcome to another episode of HR on Payroll 2.0. I'm Pete Tiliakis, and as always, I'm joined by the legendary Julie Fernandez. Welcome, Julie. Thanks, Pete. Great to see you today on a nice summer day, and I'm yes. excited for you to introduce our guest today. Yes, I'm absolutely uh, personally excited to welcome to the show uh, analyst relations expert and evangelist Robin Schaefer. Robin, welcome. Well, thank you. That's quite an <laughs> intro. I have to live up to that. All right. Yes, yes, you are the expert. I, I am. Uh, I'm a fan. I follow your your content. I think you are a much needed voice, uh, a, a, a more than much needed voice in this industry. Uh, and I am excited to pick your brain and learn from you today about uh, the analyst relations world. I think there is such a, a such a massive amount of confusion. Um, I think there's a lot of immaturity in the way firms utilize and underutilize analysts. Um, and I've seen some of even the most mature firms uh, fail to really capitalize on the strategic value of, of working with us as a channel. So I'm excited uh, to bring you on the show and, 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 and have your insights here and, and both for not just vendors, but also for the buy side. And, and Julie's going to help us give us some perspective on that as well. So Correct. thank you so much. So maybe tell us a little bit about your work, your, your background and what your company and your organization does. Yeah, I'll try to do it real quickly. So I um, have worked my entire career in B2B tech marketing, worked for several large, uh, very large vendors and did just about everything you can do under the umbrella of B2B tech marketing and all the way from uh, executing programs to strategic messaging. And then about 15 years ago, I was asked uh, to for the vendor I worked for at that point to take on analyst relations, which I knew nothing about, but quickly realized the breath and the excitement that was in that role and gave up everything else and just started focusing on that and worked for a few different vendors for a bunch of years. And then in 2020, I decided that in the midst of a pandemic, it would be a great idea to start a business. <laughs> so I, I launched on my own and just started uh, providing analyst relations uh, services to small vendors, startups, all the way to multinationals, and love it. I have never looked back, and I have three folks on the team now, so we're just cooking. Really, I happy. love it. I love it. Congratulations. It's much needed. And, and I and I really appreciate your content. I'm going to be sure to share all of your links, your blog, your website. I know you've got a YouTube channel and a book coming, right? You you mentioned um, uh, that before the show. Maybe you could tell us about your book. Yeah, yeah. I wrote, I wrote a book back in 2020 called Analysts on Analyst Relations. And the idea was um, there are a couple of books out there written by AR people yeah. about how to do AR. But I thought, um, why not just ask the analysts? Yeah. And I organized um, a whole bunch of topics for which um, the analysts could give us their opinion. So I organized that. I wrote the structure around it, um, put my own content in as, as uh, context. And it becomes a really nice read because you're not hearing from a supposed, you're not hearing from me. I mean, some of it is, but you're hearing from what different analysts say about different areas of, uh, of the, your AR program. And I think people can take away a lot of great ideas about what they can do to um, even make their programs better. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. I can't wait to see it. I'm going to, uh, you can sign, you can sign me up as a uh, first buyer. So okay, put, put well. me down, put me down. Okay. So look, we, we, uh, as you know, or may not know, Robin, we, we always cover a little bit of industry news, what's going on in the marketplace. And, uh, we've got a few, uh, pieces here, Julie, I thought we could, we could cover off on today. Absolutely. Um, first and foremost, our, our good friends over at Ramco, uh, longtime, uh, client and friend of mine. And I know you know them well. Uh, there's a new CEO to Ramco Systems, uh, Sundar Subramaniam. Congratulations. He's joined the technology firm uh, with 30 years of history in the business uh, and coming from uh, firms like Emphasis, uh, Cognizant, IBM, and PwC. So very, very, very fitting background for that. And uh, I'm excited to see what they're going to do uh, in their next uh, level of growth here. So congratulations to Ramco and congratulations to, uh, to Sundar. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, AI is in the news, as you can imagine. Um, one of my favorite uh, firms and, and, and solutions, I think, are, is just incredibly powerful for the small market buyer. Uh, HCM provider iSolve really punched up their AI uh, and, and benchmarking capabilities here in the last few weeks. They've released uh, a benchmarking solution that is going to allow their users to or their employers to be able to benchmark things like salary, 
tenure turnover, predictive, uh, you know, and, and with predictive modeling capabilities to really give them insights uh, at, at scale, right? Give small businesses big, big data uh, capabilities for uh, benchmarking their HR performance against the community of, of ISO uh, users, the anonymous, anonymized data of that. And so obviously something that's becoming very prevalent across HCM, and I think even more solutions are looking how to do this, right? They're sitting on massive pools of data. Uh, and how do you actionalize that and make it make it available to your customers uh, for for their own businesses? So I, I love seeing that. It's, it's a really nice addition to that platform. Um, they've also released a lot of AI uh, plans and and new pieces and parts to their solution. Right? They're 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 talking about um, you know more conversational virtual assistant capabilities. Uh, so think Alexa or Siri uh, through a natural language processing chatbot can get answers to questions which then gives a 24 by 7, 365, you know, uh, support, right, for, for various different, um, you know, practitioner or, or user needs. Um, they're also uh, bringing in a, a zero payroll error solution that is going to make sure that the anomaly detection is, is, and the AI are working together to find those and, and, and um, eliminate them at the source. And then, of course, just more personalization, more augmentation, particularly around recruiting is one area they've mentioned uh, that they're focused on. And then, of course, analytics everywhere, right? Just infusing their data throughout the platform so that you have that sort of, um, you know, in the in the moment, right? In in the in the course of work, access to these insights. And so, uh, I love it, right? This is the agility enabling, personalization enabling ca- capabilities that you're going to see more and more of, not just in HCM, but pretty much any product that is modern today in the in the, in the workplace is really going to have this uh, theme, right? Of personalization, augmentation. Um, and giving those, surfacing those insights for nudges, right, to make good decisions. Any thoughts on there, Julie? Anything you're, uh, I know we've had some conversations around analytics and AI in our last episodes, but any no, thoughts here? You know, no, I, only when it comes to benchmarking embedded in products, I guess I think sometimes yeah. you need to think about the fact that often you have to give data to get data, right? And mm. and early up front in a relationship that's being contracted with your legal, there's always the tendency for folks, for the, for legal part of the organization to pull out the idea of using any data, even in anonymous fashion. And um, just know up front that, it, you know, if, if you've let that happen or that's happened, that may hinder your avail- your ability to tap into um, some of the uh, benchmarking that a product mm-hmm. might naturally offer you. So yeah, you have to think about that earlier and then you would normally have to think about that. Yes. Good point. Very good point. So, uh, sorry, go ahead. Anything yeah, else? Yeah, but no, well, let's get to the next one. Let's get yeah, to the, the one. next one. Uh, Safeguard Global, again, good friends of ours, right? Uh, I had an opportunity to sit down with Bjorn Reynolds, the founder, um, this last Friday. We, he and I sat down and we dug into uh, the launch of Chat SG, which is, as you can imagine, powered by OpenAI's Chat GPT. I think we're at what, iteration four now, four or four or five? I think it's four for Chat GPT right now. And that architecture is leveraging, obviously, a deep learning capability, a generative AI capability, and an NLP capability to really give a conversational interface for users to go in and get answers to questions across things like compliance and workforce, uh, uh, you know, um, going into another country, let's say, right? So, for example, I took it and I played around with it, right? And I said, hey, tell me, what, what does it take to hire someone in Greece? Like, what kind of, what kind of employment contract do I need? Um, do, you know, can I pay them, you know, any sort of way? Or is there, a certain, is there certain rules around that, right? So I was able to go and ask several questions to help me understand what it would be like to employ someone there, right? Get, get answers to my uh, compliance and workforce questions. And I think what's, uh, what's interesting about this is that, you know, when I was talking to Bjorn, you know, he sees this as just the beginning of what uh, could be possible, right, for a, a potential conversational interface to the world, the ability for someone to really sit down and not only make uh, maybe do some research and get some answers about, about uh, you know, going into or operating or working in another country but uh, or supporting a workforce there, but also maybe taking action against that, right? Maybe going and looking for a best fit candidate and, and then maybe setting up an interview and, and creating the experience for onboarding. So there's a lot of, uh, lot of opportunity here. Um, today, this is sitting on top of, this isn't just scraping Google and going out and finding basic answers. It's actually sitting on top of Safeguard's uh, knowledge base and knowledge zone that gives their customers, uh, that powers all of their products. Um, and it's really pulling across that and giving them the ability to get these answers very quickly. Uh, you can play around with it yourself. It's it's free to um, it's free to engage. And and I I've actually written an article about my experience with this, Julie. And 
and their roadmap plans here. So I'll, I'll be putting that out very soon, likely next week. Uh, and I've even embedded uh, a screen video of what my experience was talking to uh, Chad SG and getting getting answers on my favorite country of Greece uh, as a as a as a use case for uh, for answering questions around you know what what's it like if I want to if I want to hire someone and and how would it work? And so uh, yeah, I think this is this is what you're going to see more of, right? It's a step towards that. Um, what I think is going to be a, a, a zero UI UI in the future, where we're talking more to our applications and getting um, responses and answers in real time, versus maybe going logging into a, a platform and, and 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 putting information in and waiting for something to come back. So, uh, yeah, really exciting. I think I think you're seeing a lot more Chat GPT across the marketplace, and and it's good to see it come into the EOR world. Yeah, I think it'll just be interesting. These first movers, you know, when we see this stuff, it's so exciting. It's so fun to share. I'm glad that you called out the fact that it's available widely. So, you know, yeah. it's not just a for customer thing. You can go in there and tamper with it and do exactly what you did and play around. Yeah. Um, what is inevitable as, you know, the market races to chat GPT is just, you know, many similar tools, just like having tons of blog content, right? Or tons of article content available. And you have to figure out what is the quality of one versus the other. Uh, we're a fair stitch away from that, but, um, but, you know, just anticipating that's coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is a blessing for compliance, right? The ability to punch in, you know, uh, put in a whole bunch of data, right? I mean, th these, these rules are ch coming fast and furious, they're complicated. They're 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 building off of other regulations that were already there. I mean, the ability to go in and 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 have something like a, a, a technology that can sift through all of that and give you the information that you need specifically, I think, is is really critical and and in real time, right? Especially for the employee, right? You think about like trying to get answers within policy, within procedure, within law. Um, you know that that's a that's a there's that's part of the employee experience too, right? And I think that this is this is an opportunity to help employees get that speed uh, and productivity, right? Productivity is front of mind right now for everyone. Um, and these augmentative capabilities, I think, are going to help practitioner and employee uh, get in, get out, get the information they need uh, and do it much more, have much more effective outcomes. So uh, I love it. It's just the beginning. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see more. I know it for sure. Okay, so I think it's a great segue. Uh, Robin, one of the things that caught my eye recently was an article that you wrote about artificial intelligence in the analyst relations world. And I wanted to start here um, and maybe go from there to talk about, you know, analyst relations and, and the state of it today and how firms ought to really be looking at it. But uh, yeah, how, how, how about from your perspective, where AI is, is, is starting to impact your role and the, and, and the marketing role as well? Yeah, I don't know that they're the... the the article was uh, intentionally forward looking. Like I didn't want to get yeah. up on chat GPT and the current, <laughs> um, the current tools that people are associated with AI, but think about it in a broader um, level. And I don't see, think anybody's really doing that, you know, for example, yeah. um, instead of reading, uh, pulling down and reading a bunch of reports, can I um, ask the, 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 the internet a question, you know, really ask the, the world a question that I'm looking for some stats or some trends and be mm -hmm. able to pull that together for me with all of the references, as opposed to trying to pull that out from reading individual reports. That's the kind of thing that I think is going to really elevate what AR can do because yeah. now it's, it's more of a you know, uh, I don't want to say administrative, but it's more of a, a, a tactical role. But now you can get really strategic about not only, um, you know, managing the relationships, but really managing the content that comes from um, analysts and being able yeah. to more easily share that within your company. Yeah, absolutely. And and probably even do some analysis against it, right? There's a lot of opinions uh, across firms, right? And and that way, you know, you're you're able to bring all that together and maybe get some context that you weren't thinking of or or didn't see. So, yeah, I love it. I, I think there's so many cool ways in which AI is going to make our lives uh, much easier, much better. Certainly going to be some disruption, but um, yeah, I love it. And I and I, I think about when I think about generative AI and marketing, right? I'm excited about you know, the ability for it to actually create things in the future, right? Presentations and right. Uh, I mean, just you name it, right? How many late hours at night did vendors and Julie, I know you've been there, right? Where you're pitching, um, you know, pitching a solution or something uh, and, and you've got these crunches at night of trying to get these ready um, and out the door. So it's going to be, it's going to be very blessing that way. So, you know, but I discovered yeah, something go ahead, with, with yeah. uh, 
chat GPT that I had, I might be yeah. the last person in the world to understand <laughs> it. So I apologize if you know this, but you can ask chat GPT to critique a piece of work that you've created. Oh, nice. I did not know that. That's oh. interesting. Oh, good. So I'm not very good. On All right. Now you are. I didn't know that. <laughs> so I do some creative writing, which you think is very subjective. It's not factual. Yeah. And I put in, for example, I put in a piece and it gave me a damn good critique of it, of yeah. what the, the strengths were, what the weaknesses were, what it liked. Mm. Really scary, smart. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. I think I've seen some of the writing that's come out of it. And I, I like to call it soulless, right? There's, <laughs> there, yeah. there's a lot of facts, but not a lot of like soul to it, not a lot of opinion, you know, but, but that's not what that's one way I hadn't actually considered. And I'll be honest, I have chat GPT on my desktop. I actually, I don't use it that often, to be honest, I, I, I normally use it as a second opinion for things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I'll be candid. I've played around with it in titling. I, I don't like titling stuff sometimes, yeah. although I feel like I'm actually kind of good at it. So I've used it as, Hey, here are the titles I'm thinking of. Give me, give me some ideas and it'll kick back some variations, which I've been helpful, but uh, I hadn't used it that way. So that's a very, that's a very interesting way to use it. Use case to use it for, but uh, I could see that being very helpful. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. It was quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good, good. I, don't, I yeah. have no idea how it does that. I mean, I understand large language models, but I don't understand how it does that. <laughs> so that, yeah, well, that's a good, yeah. Maybe that's for, maybe that's for another episode. You're right. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's fascinating, but these are the things that we need, right? The augmentation that we're talking about, right. And think about H think that about that in the context of HR. I mean, HR is already getting whipped pretty hard for not being strategic enough. I mean, I think this is the opportunity, right? Generative has the chance to relieve that minutia that payroll and HR are dealing with to where they can return focus uh, to, to more value added work. And I'm hoping that this is going to be that blessing for them. I think that's happening in, in all roles. And I, uh, in the yeah. new edition of my book, which is coming out in September. Yes. Um, yes. I added a chapter on how AI is affecting the analyst role. So I did oh, a yes. bunch of interviews with analysts. Like what do you see your role as an analyst how you see it being affected. And yeah. there was a lot of, you know, the same points, but people had very, very interesting perspectives. Uh, you know, a center thing is exactly what you're saying because it's true for HR people. It's true for analysts. It's true for everybody. Taking away the mundane, the time consuming work and having it augmented leaves you to add more value to what you're doing. Yes. That's the yeah. Core, the core principle. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and look, I, I, what what do analysts do, right? We sift through a lot of data and we try to find the the, the, the things that people don't see, right? The, the trends people don't see. And I think that's where the, the AI is going to be very helpful. Absolutely. Yes. And creating PowerPoints and helping us create reports is going to be great. But I think there's still going to be a need for that critical thinking, emotional intelligence, and and that uh, creativity that I don't, I think some in some ways, this, these solutions don't really offer right now. There's There's just a lack of soul for it. So... Yeah, but but look uh, along this th this conversation around the analyst role. That that is one thing I was just so excited to have you on for. Right, I th I feel like just just being an analyst. There's so much confusion. I think first of all, I think we have horrible titles, but but the confusion for what we do and what we actually provide organizations, both buy side and and vendor. It's 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 confusing. I think to some. And yes. do, do you see that as well, Robin? Do you oh think? Oh my God, yeah. So first yeah. of all, before I even answer it, I want to ask yeah. you why <laughs> yeah. you think the title is so misleading. Uh, I think part of it is that it sounds incredibly junior. And okay. in reality, most analysts are incredibly senior. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, you know, and I'm not a person who I, I feel like I need a title uh, in any way, but I don't think analysts really dictates the executive level uh, experience and insights and strategic value that we pr bring That's to the table. Great, right? I never really thought about it that way, but that is a fabulous point. Yeah, it just does not. And, and I, and I, and I don't care that, it, that you can call me whatever you want to call me, but mm -hmm. I think there's sometimes when I say I'm an analyst, I think some people look at me and think like, well, geez, aren't you, haven't you been in your career a little while? You know what I mean? Like, what are you, what are you doing? Right. Because analyst in a, in a big four consulting firm is a junior per first, first time mm -hmm. consultant. Right. So yeah. it's just a little bit of a weird, weird, that weird thing there. But, but even if you go beyond that, I think if you went to vendors and you asked, I mean, I even look at my clients sometimes and, and they didn't know I did, you know, 
I a big part of what I do is go to market strategy work, right? Helping C suites understand how to do better in in going to market with their products. And um, I don't know that 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 title or 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 the idea of what we've done, you know, in the past being very report driven and uh, producing market analysis. Um, that that really demonstrates to them, I think, what we really, the value we really bring to the table. And that's something I, I, I'm hoping we can clear up a little bit on this show. Yeah, I think I think that's right on. And I would have to say almost 100% of the companies I've worked with or clients I've worked with, um, the executives see the analyst relationship as one way. The analyst is going to help me sell, promote, get my brand yes. out there and push me in the market. And I have to get on the reports and I have to get those relationships going so I can be in the top right and all that good stuff. And that's leaving most of, I think most of the value on the table, because if you consider the inbound, the advice, the feedback, the recommendation side of what analysts do, because of from their perch as being um, experts on an industry, as knowing what the competitors are doing and knowing what the customers want, knowing what the trends are and having that high level view, they can add so much value to your you know, internal workings of your organization, whether it be your product roadmap, whether it's your partnering plan, whether it's your messaging or go to market plan or, you know, literally any part of your business can be uh, speeded by talking and getting input from an in industry analyst. They give excellent, excellent feedback and support. Um, and if you take their ideas and if you manage those to the fact, uh, to the extent that you, you take ideas, you vet them, you determine what is truly actionable, you take action on it. And then in the best case scenario, you actually measure the value of that action you took, of the value of putting that feature on your roadmap or going after a different market or, you know, building a new partnership or something. Yeah. That it's going to like, 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 so outweigh the value you get by being on a report, honestly. Yeah, so absolutely. Company. Yeah. Yeah. That relationship is key. I, I know that, you know, I, I always say this and I'm sure it sounds like a sales pitch, but I always say to my vendors that I work with, like, look, the vendor, the vendors I work with for the longest time, get the most results out of it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It's hard to work together in these little short sprints. It's fine if you're doing a white paper together or you're doing something, but to really make, to move the needle and to work together over a period of time, I think that's where a lot of impact come, comes into play. And, and I've had vendors that I've worked with uh, consecutively for a long time and others I've kind of worked with off and on. Um, and I find that, um, you know, they get, we get a lot of value out of working together over, over a period because it can make those, I can make those suggestions and recommendations and help them, yep. you know, implement them. And also, you know, ultimately, um, you know, help them pivot if needed in, in, in various different ways as, and when it comes up. But, but I find the value that, that comes out of our engagements tend to be really rich when we've worked together for a long time, because we also get to know each other much, much better. Um, I find as well, but do, do you find like, like, I, I think that, I think there's a lot of vendors who don't see, and I think they should, or and I'm just curious your opinion about seeing analysts as a channel, right? You talked about engaging buyers and that's certainly what every vendor wants, but, but I think we're a very important channel in the, in the go-to-market ecosystem. And part of that is our knowledge, but also our, certainly our brands, but what do you, what's your viewpoint on that? And and what, what would you say to vendors who maybe miss out on that? Don't, don't engage that channel. Yeah. So when you say a channel, do you mean like, like you think of a traditional marketing channel or go to market? Yeah. I mean, you know, just in the same way vendors have partners, right? They have uh, consulting firms, maybe they work with, or, you know, just, a, just an ecosystem of, of folks outside of their own organization that they work with. I, I call it a channel, but maybe it's not the right yeah, word, yeah, but yeah. But you know what I mean? I, I, I kind of feel like it's an important um, aspect of, of product and important, important aspect of marketing. And just curious what your thoughts are on, on that as, as analysts, as a channel. Yeah. So I think analysts as a channel is the thing that people you know jump to first, in my view. Um, and when I say a channel, meaning a way to, like I said before, a way to get their messages out, a way to reach buyers. And they... Um, and you, you can't ignore that because analysts are extremely influential in one way or the other on what's happening in the market and what those buyers are going through, that buyer's journey. They have a yeah. lot of impact. It's been proven many, many times that analysts are among the top 
influencers of uh, business deals. So um, they are a very important channel to get your get your messages out there and not only getting the messages out there, but helping you craft what those messages should be and will be effective. Yes. Yeah. Resonating, right? Resonating. Yes. So, yeah. So hey, Julie, go ahead. The, yeah. Well, one of the things that's really striking me and I've been clear about, but I'm not sure that, you know, across the entire industry, it's very clear is uh, just the importance of the providers as being kind of the primary stakeholder and client. Um, for the analysts, right? Um, because when you work with the practitioners, they're very familiar with the the results that are being produced and become um, socialized, you know, in whatever forms those research areas are. But I think that a lot of practitioners and even client side buyers don't understand, you know, really how the sausage is made. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and, and and how it is that you know you you get you garner those in depth uh, insights and then package them and yep. and uh, really vet them um, and so what they end up seeing it or getting attached to is kind of a an end chart or you know peak or valley or square or whatever totally. right whatever sort of thing they think about as presenting or summarizing that information or get familiar with reports but they don't really understand the critical role that analysts play vis-a-vis -vis the provider developing their own, you're market makers, right? In many yeah. cases, because you're helping develop the offering and think about, you know, exactly how it, it's used best in the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, totally, we, agree. totally agree. With yeah. You, Robin, when you think about, or maybe this is actually for both of you. I want to, I'm going to ask you both this. Maybe Julie, you can, you can kind of take the buy side sort of viewpoint here, but like, the modern marketplace has changed, right? Thing, the way we're buying is different. I mean, geez, I, I, I heard, you know, there's a, there's a number of vendors who are now like even going into like Snapchat and TikTok and some other areas that are just, you know, new, right? It's just totally different than what we've seen in the past. Um, you know, certainly COVID and the pandemic kind of, I saw a lot of DIY sort of buying coming around, particularly down market when it came to HR products during that time. Yeah. But like, the modern marketplace, like what, where do you think the role of analysts has come, you know, evolved to at this point? And, and I'd love to just sort of hear your point of view, Robin, maybe from the vendor perspective, and then Julie, maybe from the buy side, like, do you think it's changed a lot or is it really still very, very much the same? You know, we talk about that a lot within the AR community, you know, how things have changed um, with analysts and their influence on buyers. I think uh, what you're talking about an influence on vendors is what you're and the way they work with vendors, right? So yeah, just in general, I'm just wondering in the marketplace today that the, where analysts sort of fit in, has that really changed in okay. terms of what it was in the past, right? I mean, are, 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 are you seeing that still or, and how they're viewed, right? I mean, even how buyer and vendor view uh, and, and leverage the analysts, has that, has that evolved much since, since the last several years? I think so. So I think if yeah. you go back, um, there wasn't access to information. So people were completely dependent on analysts to help them, you know, make decisions, right? Because information was not readily available. Yeah. Now you see, you see information being more readily available, but people still going to analysts because, um, and then I see with AI and the future, there's going to be even more information. And I think that means people go more to analysts because the more information there is, the more you just want the darn answer. You yes. Don't wanna, we don't want to pour through this volumes of information and try to make sense of what fits for your situation. You need an expert to help sort through all that, to help you find the match to what you're dealing with. And I see analysts as important and valuable as always to those buyers. And I think, I think they're going to become even more valuable into the future. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think there's a, a, you know, and I want to talk a little bit next about sort of engaging, but I think there's a, there, there's a, there's a maturity level that says, Hey, we don't know everything. And, and the, the analysts, not that we know everything, but we, but we know a lot about what's going on in the marketplace, right? We've got a very good perspective. And I think that more firms need to tap into that. Yep. Um, and, and I think that the maturity around that says a lot when an organization can open the kimono show the warts and say, give us your honest feedback, help us guide us on this messaging, guide us on what we're thinking. Are we off base? Are we on base? Are we, are we disrupting or, or do we just think we, 
we are and we're not, right? And I think that that takes maturity, right? And being able to say, look, we don't have all the answers and we need to come uh, and, and regularly have a dialogue with the marketplace experts that do. So uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. But but Julie, what, what about your viewpoint of the buyers? Do buyers look at analysts any differently now than they did in the past? Are they using them differently, you think, or... Well, I think they're I think they're misunderstood, right? And oftentimes yeah. the the value is kind of um, boils down to uh, things that the analyst produces that become socialized to answer key questions or spot information like who's playing in the space, right? Or or what clients do they have? Or what is the like what's the roadmap or what's next, right? Those are snippets of information that are part yeah. of the overall context and picture that, that you're really diving very deeply in to understand and to differentiate uh, across the provider community. And the more that HR organizations in particular undergo large transformations as opposed to, you know, like a small niche uh, market buy, I think the harder it is for the analyst community to really um, – get the um, the context within yeah. which the client is asking these questions. And, and it might be one of the things that, you know, that the advisor community gets a lot of context, but, um, you know, but we're not in the deep and detailed depths mm-hmm. of the provider community who's telling you what's new, right? So they're, they're, they've always been very totally different, um, different spaces. And um, I just don't think it's widely understood exactly how you get those snippets or what you do to have that insight um, that when they just come to you kind of for those top of mind spot items out of often out of context, really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What what do you think about what do you think about quadrants, Robin? I'm not a fan personally. I don't think there's anything magical about any of them. (laughs) And I don't think that I didn't I hated making them. And I also excuse me. I also think that. That's not the way buyers really ought to buy. They ought to buy use case wise, right? Like look at the use cases that they're right. focused on solving, where that product's heading, can it solve it? Can it can it help you where, where you're going in the future versus, oh, who's got the most stuff? Yep. <clears throat> oh, the same normal three that always win. Like but what are your thoughts on that? Are people tired of those? Do you do you agree? Do you disagree? I don't think that people are tired of them. I think people, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of what I related to what I mentioned before. People want a nice, simple chart to net it all out and show them where everybody's positioned. People like that kind of simplicity. And I think there'll always be a place for that in the market. Yeah. However, if you talk yeah. to any good analyst, they'll say, this is just a slice. This doesn't tell you, you need to yes. talk to us to understand what you're going through, what challenges you're facing, what use cases you have. If we're going to make a meaningful, have a meaningful discussion about how to solve those with the, with the vendor, with the provider. So um, it, there's always a good, a good debate. Um, I was having yesterday about if you're a small player and you're just starting to embark on being evaluated by an analyst, you're just getting big enough and there is a report that you're being con- you're considering trying to get into. And you're probably going to be a niche, you know, or a, a low, I don't know, whatever they call them, you know, in, in the in the in the not good position. You know, when someone's yeah. looking at the whole thing, you're not in there. And people will say, yeah, but you're part of the conversation. Yeah. You need to get yeah. part of the conversation. You need to get to the table. If you're on those charts, you get part of the, you get the visibility to be considered. Um, yeah. Even if you're not, you know, so it's, it's a debate. I think it depends a lot where your competitors are and who you see competing and, and how you stack up against them in the report. Um, but yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, I'm curious your thoughts. I think there's, there's, you know, just a, a place for that. And I think the market likes those things. Oh, I I have to say, Pete, I have to say, yeah. because, you know, we all, we all know the especially the major flavors of, you know, these, these different visuals and, um, and there's actually, it's anybody who knows and is familiar with a variety of them could pick up any one of a square or, a chart or whatever the visual is and say, now tell me why these hand, you know, these guys, you know, why they're even part of the picture and these guys, like, why are they even here? Right. Yep. Um, And it will vary from, you know, one analyst firm to another. And, you know, and then those who have been in the space and especially you guys in the AR space, you know, understand, well, like there were certain thresholds. So that's why, you know, in this, this particular view, these folks wouldn't even appear, even though they're very much part of the conversation. And that Mm -hmm. alone is, is so 
frustrating on the buy side yeah. to me. It is a necessary evil. I totally agree yeah. with Robin. I yeah. don't think it's yeah. going away yeah. anytime soon because people want to see that. Yeah. But it just curls my blood when, you know, I, I watch buyers who say, well, I'm just going to go pick up the latest graph. And those are the folks that, you know, yeah. I need to invite to an RFP or, yeah. you know, that qual that is their qualifier. And it's usually without the interaction with an analyst yes. or even an advisor. And that is the part that is super frustrating, but it's also why the providers play so yeah. hard to get on yeah. the visual, right? Yeah. yeah, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't commenting on the quality of them, by the way, or whether they are actually representative. I was just saying that the reality of people is that they want, I mean, yeah, yeah. they want things yeah. simple. And whether it's, it's human nature not, is, is not or meaningful or not, yeah. is not always a consideration. Yeah. Let, let me give you a uh, example of this in real life. I think to summarize what you're saying, Robert, is it, you know, as analysts, I'd say the number one question that we're asked, especially at events, especially at um, places where we get around a lot of buyers is what's the best fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And I always tell them there's no answer to that. I can't give you an answer to that. And it's not on a chart. It's what's best for your use cases, what's best for your trajectory, what's best for your needs. It's not about what what was ranked number one, because what's ranked number one might not necessarily be number one for your right. your you know your footprint, right? It's got to fit you to, perfectly. And that, that I think, uh, and you can see people go, oh, right, you're right. You know what I mean? Like they get that. And I'm, and I'm not saying don't use the quadrants as a guidepost. I think it's a guidepost. But I think you have to sit down with your unique use cases, your unique requirements, and your unique path forward to where you're trying to go to, right? And say, what is the right things to bring to the table that is going to solve that for us and bring us to where we want? So I hope yeah. that people, you're right, it's human nature, right? We want the easiest on-demand answer. It's never going to be, we don't want to do the homework, right? We don't want to do the math. <laughs> Well, right. those things, so they move slowly too, right? So yes. what's number one? And you spend all this time, you know, reaching the certain area in the visual that you want to, you know, you want to be portrayed at. But it also means that, you know, that uh, folks who's, uh, who aren't as new and innovative take a little while to make their way out of those, those spaces in the chart. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's hard. Things, yeah. That are hard to depict in those. Yeah. And every, every industry has its, or every market has its whale, right? It's, it's one behemoth that dominates everything. I mean, I feel like that's just sort of what it is, unless it's a new, a new area. Um, and it's going to feel daunting, right? We're not the X billion dollar company. We're the, we're the, we're the younger uh, emerging firm who's disrupting in this way or that way. Um, and how do you get people to consider your platform or your solution over maybe one of the big you know, the big 300 pound gorillas. So, yeah. And I think, I think being on those charts kind of validates that you are real, you know, you're some yes. that you should pay attention to and that works. You know, mm -hmm. another thing very related to this is the fact that a lot of analysts are organized by technology. You know, yes, everybody has a slice of a technology. And as we know, technologies are more and more specific as you go along and people ca ca cover a technology. However, like you said, use cases, would be a better way to organize right? By, or, or by business problem is another way I say it. So I have this business problem. There may be several types, different types of technologies that don't compete with each other because they're in their little silos. But guess what? To the buyer, they're competing for the way to solve this problem. Yes, right? that's a great point. And analysts tend to be down and focused on the technology that they support and understand the business problems it solves, but don't always see, well, you can solve, you can go up another mountain, you know, to get to that, to that peak, you know, completely different mountain uh, to, to address the same goal. And you don't necessarily see that if you're just technology oriented. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, just, just kind of pivoting over back to this maturity point, right? I've come across vendors who are incredibly mature for their size and age. And then I've come across some that are shamefully immature for their size and age. Yep. But what do you, what's your, what's your thoughts on that, Robin? What, what, what do you say to young firms that are new wanting to really get a good foundation going, or even those that are kind of late adopters? Like what would be your advice for say, getting an, an, an analyst program going and kind of you know, maybe it's a crawl, walk, run thing. What, what does it look like in your advice for, for those, you know, so, either, like I said, early entrants or late adopters? So any, any, at any level, it's about what is new, different, better, differentiated, 
uh, I would say innovative, but that word is overused about your solution. Yeah. So if I talk to a startup and I, I ask them, so what's special? You know, what's special about your company? What's special and why should people buy? And they can't give me a compelling answer. Uh, we're cheaper, we're faster, we're whatever. Um, they're a me too, right? And the analysts are not going to be necessarily interested in them. Um, so they might have minimal success with working with an analyst relations program because they don't have in their heart and soul a real passion and difference and why they why they exist and why they should exist and what's um, valuable about them, right? So that's kind of a not, not exactly your question, but it's like a table stakes. Yeah. And a lot of times larger companies can't define that. You know, they define it in terms of um, kind of status quo features. Well, we're better at this. We're not, you know, or, or f functionality or capabilities or characteristics. And that's not what analysts really drive analysts. I mean, when you're really, when a space matures, they have to look at those things and compare it, but it doesn't wake them up and get their interest and, you know, pique their interest. Right. So at a core, whatever size you are, you've got to find that center of what is your purpose? What is your mission? What is your, your different about the way you do things and then hammer on that. Um, so I, I always say that that's a, a critical first step in doing an analyst relations program at every level. That's a great point. Yeah. I, I've, I've actually helped a few firms redefine their differentiators, right? They, they all come to you and say, well, we differentiate on service. And I'm like, that's fine, but everybody does. Yep. What else, right? What else you yeah. got, you know, and, and help them put, and they don't realize sometimes that they are differentiating in ways that they had, right. they had no clue. Right? right. And, and, and that I think is where we can help. So, yeah. And what about, um, sorry, go ahead. Good. No, I was going to say, so if, you know, when I talk to, to startups, you know, if they've really got that idea, even if they're on the napkin stage, even if they yeah. have their product launched and have customers and have a Rolodex of customers and revenue, they have a really interesting disruptive idea. The analysts really want to hear about it. And they, yeah, great uh, first start. And frequently people think they're too small. They're not developed enough. The analysts aren't going to be interested. Wrong. They are going to be really interested if, you, if you've got something really interesting to talk about. Yeah. Robin, that just makes me feel like, you know, like you guys should be known as the shark tank. Yeah. You know, the shark tank. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, really. Um <laughs> we're nicer. Be we're some nicer. Branding. Forget being an analyst. Yeah. I'm a shark. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. No, it's a great point. I, I think it's a great so. point. If if you think you're innovative, you're going to find out real fast when you talk to an analyst and they fall asleep during a briefing, you know, or they're doing email because they've heard it all before. You're going to find out even if you, you know, even through a briefing, if you've got something or not, if you're hot in the trail, if they're engaged, if they're asking questions, if they want to talk to you again. You get feedback just from that. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, even just that just that perspective of, hey, look, you're way off, or hey, wow, you really got something here. Yep. I mean, that's enough to give you a guidepost yep. to begin saying, hey, we, we, know we, we know we can do something with this, right? Or, hey, we got to go back and maybe do a little bit more work. So what, where do you get started, Robin? Like, what, how do you pick what firms you go to, what reports you use? Like, I'll tell you, I'm really good. I, I don't know if everyone does this, but I'm very good about admitting when a, when, a, when a firm comes to me and saying, look, I'm not right for you. I'd love to learn about you, but you'd be better off to work with this vendor or that, or excuse me, this part, th th excuse me, this analyst or that analyst. Uh, but I, you know, I don't know so much if that happens everywhere. And the reality of it is, is I think there's, it's a little overwhelming, right? Like yeah. you're, you're new. You, where do we start? What do I do? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when I get a, a new client um, and I need to build that analyst list, right? What, what firm yeah. analysts are we going to care about and, and how are they prioritized? So we do like in, in my, in my company, we do a lot of research, basically how they define themselves, you know, how they, they define their coverage areas how they, what they write about. We look a lot about what are they writing about? What are they covering? What keywords are relevant to your business that they're writing about? Maybe not even a vendor, but they're writing about that topic, you know, employee engagement or some topic. Um, and that really helps you identify the large field of analysts that are um, in, your, in your space. And you might find a hundred analysts, you know, that are tangentially involved in what you do. Then the hard part is prioritizing them. 
because what you need to do always is have a priority of analysts. And I always do the tier, most people do the tier one, two, and three, right? Yeah. So yep. keep tier one to like seven to 10 analysts per company or business line, right? Because you want to focus on them because they're the ones that are going to give you the most value. And value is judged by what your business objectives are. If you're really out there and you've got to, you know, differentiate and get your brand across, that's what's holding you back. You know, it's like, what are your obstacles and how can analysts help you? Then you need to really get um, the analysts that can help you refine your value proposition, refine your brand, refine your messaging and help you get that out to the market, right? If you're trying to um, sell and you just need sales and revenue and you see that, like you've got your branding and you just need to move fast on selling, it might be different analysts, you know, that are more in the direct um, advice and recommendation side. So depending on what you need to do in your business, if you're launching a, a significant new product, you need people that can help you with that, right? So you would prioritize your analysts against what your business goals are. Who's going to help? Who are the ones, the seven to 10 that are going to help you most, not by some vague uh, definition of value and priority, but that align the most and the best with your business objectives. It's not an easy exercise because there's no, um, there's no like uh, crystal ball that tells you how influential or how good an analyst is in a particular space, right? But yep. you can do your best guess. And I always say, you know, tiering is very dynamic. You pick, you do your best guess picking seven analysts to start with. And then you go through them and you realize they're not the ones. And then you go to an, another group where you constantly are, are moving people up and down based on engagement, based on what they're writing, based on your company's priorities changing. So that's just generally how you um, provide that kind of focus on who you talk to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it you know it is it is very much you're right aligning to those voices that align to the types of things you're working yeah. in, right? And certainly those that are going to give you the perspectives um, that that can give you. Is there a, is there a number? Is there a set? I mean, do do you do you have? I mean, you can't participate in everything sometimes, right? It's it's a it's very time consuming. But do you have a benchmark of of where you tried to tell firms to to participate in these sort of competitive uh, type analysis? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Is there too many, you know? Well, there are too many, right? So they have to be very uh, judicious because they take an enormous yeah. amount of effort for the, um, the 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 vendor to participate in those. There's usually a RFI or a survey of, you know, 200 questions and they have to do a presentation and a demo and get customer references and it's a big lift, right? Yeah. So, you know, frankly, um, you know, Known in the market is the is the Gartner piece and the Forrester piece and the IDC piece. Those are the biggest three firms. And if they're doing reports that you fit into, you sort of have to do that because that's going to be critical to your success to be in those reports and to 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 you know create relationships with those analysts. Yeah, beyond that, yeah, absolutely. Beyond that, you have to look at. So if you're not in a report with a top analyst, I had a client recently who was, they didn't, there wasn't a report yet for their space that they could fit into or that they, you know, they, they would, they, they should pursue. Yes. Yes. I've come across this. Yeah. And then we found um, a second tier firm, you know, beyond the first three, but beyond the big three, but a pretty good firm that had a report that was dead on in their space. And we yeah. said, we have to get into that even though they're not as big as a, of an, of a firm, because we're not, there's no other reports, you know, they don't exist that this one hits the nail on the head um, right. in terms of what their research is. So we're going to go with them. So that's you know part of it, how well the research really serve, how well you're going to do, right. How well it's serving yeah. your value proposition. And then, you know, the top three are evident. The next level down is a little hard to pick through and define, but certainly a, if you've never heard of the firm, really question whether you should participate. Yeah, no, understood, understood. Yeah, I think it's largely about too that also the uh, the analyst brand themselves as well, right? Like I feel like my my personal brand is far bigger than my my firm I've launched, uh, just given my longevity in the marketplace. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. I think that all of those things certainly have to come into matter 
when you're when you're picking this. Now, now you had something. I, I was reading one of your blogs where you where you mentioned something around the concept of making a big splash with little dollars. Yes. Um, What's your, because I, I deal with a lot of uh, emerging and mature firms, but in some of my emerging firms, they believe they, you know, maybe don't have the budgets to do yep. analyst relations, right? Yep. Uh, what do you, what, what are your thoughts on how to do that? Uh, the best way to make the, make your most bang for the buck, I guess. Yeah. So right or wrong, yeah. right or wrong. This is the way I think about it. I think that um, a company should only spend with an analyst firm for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. They um, want it, want feedback inquiry. The, the inbound side, because they're not going to give that other than a, a high level feedback. They're not going to give you that kind of, you know, coaching advisory and deep work for free, right? You have to have yeah. a commercial relationship to get that. Right. And that is really worth, you know, investing in. And then the second thing is for um, content, right? So if yes. you want to want a thought leadership paper or a webinar, getting a third party validation, not to say, Hey, this is great company and paint you all rosy, but just to talk about the problems that you solve, right. In a way that interested parties, your target audience is going to be interested in. That's going to be a valuable piece of content. Well, you put, you associate with a firm, a, a third party firm, it gives you instant validity versus writing something yourself. Yes. Yes. So client case studies as well. Exactly. Exactly. All the, all uh, the whole, when I think of that as, as really content marketing, I don't think of it purely as analyst relations. Yes. So I can get great point. from my friends over in content marketing because they are charged with putting pieces out in the marketplace and I can help them get some third party, a third party piece in the marketplace that's going to do really well. And help them, but that's like a different mindset, I think, than than the core of what analyst relations are, which is that advice, guidance, input, and then that um, um, that channel to get your messages out in the market. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly how our firm is established, right? We, we're centered around advisory work, uh, research work, and content work, and each of those. Uh, interchange and work together to help the vendor uh, in a number of different ways. Our vendor clients and certainly our audience is is by side, right? We're we're communicating our our products to and our our content. But um, yeah, no, I, I think there's a lot of firms, young young firms, that think, oh, we're we're too small for that, right? We can't, you know, we we can't afford it or uh, it's not the right time. And I I, I love that you've kind of cleared up some of that here because I, yeah, think, that I think the sooner the better, I right? I think with most startup firms, they should hold back. Yeah. And investing because, uh, you know, the misconception in the market is I'm going to invest in one of these big firms and they're going to match up and yeah. cover me. And, you know, um, somebody said the other day, it's kind of like uh, buying a gym membership and never going to the gym. Right. Yep. Expecting to get fit. You know, if you're going to invest yeah. <laughs> in a uh, analyst um, subscription, you're going to really do it because you're going to put the energy into learning yes. and building those relationships and getting that value out of it. And it takes a lot of effort from the vendor to make the value come out. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm saying the same thing again. Um, up to the vendor to put that energy time into that to get out of it what they can. Yes. The analyst yeah. relationship. Yeah, but it's never too early, I think, to engage, right? You could certainly no. brief analysts. Where you know, I, that's one thing that that, that I always um, you know, I always feel bad when when vendors sometimes it's like they'll hold back on on briefing because they're not they're not a, a subscriber. And I'm like, look, it's okay. We can, yeah. I just want to learn what you're doing. Right. And then, and, and these younger firms, they don't know that. And so it's never, it doesn't cost you anything. It shouldn't cost you anything that's, to engage an analyst firm. That's where I would get to. I, I kind of I yeah. interrupted myself. I'm sorry about that because yeah. I'm always encouraged. You know, the first thing is get on the, get on their radar. Yeah. Right? And Teach go us. tell your story. Go tell your yeah. story to as many analysts as, you know, relevant to you, not as many, but you know, the top ones that you find relevant. And then from that, you're going to, first of all, that'll take you so far, you know, and you can, you know, only take you so far. And then at some point you say, well, if I want to go further and get more value out of the analysts, I need to invest. So don't do it at first. Yep. Do it after you see a clear ROI. And the other thing yes. is do it once you meet a Pete or a Jennifer who you say they get it they can help me because in the nature of a, in the, in the interaction of a briefing, you really get a sense of what that analyst questions are, what their feed, you know, their, their high level feedback is. 
and what they can help you with. So if you meet a lot of analysts, you're going to click with some and you're going to say, I want to work with that, that guy more uh, or that girl yes. more. And then that is where you want to then invest to get more value. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So look, I want to pivot a little bit here. I want to ask your opinion about, so, so Julie and I, we're, we're, we're in the HR and payroll world. And one of the conundrums in the payroll world is where does payroll report? Is it HR or is it finance, right? It's a mm. chicken or the egg mm. to me. I, I call it the payroll's chicken or the egg moment. Um, what about analyst relations? Yeah. I have an opinion about this, but I'd love to hear your opinion. Where should analyst relations be reporting in an organization? And does that change from startup to, to, you know, emerging to then mature at some point, how do you, what, what do you recommend in that way for in terms of where that reports? I don't think it really changes as a for, for matures because I yeah. feel really strongly that product marketing is the home for analyst relations. Yeah. And you don't see it there hardly ever. Yeah. You see it under communications, under marketing. Well, sometimes product marketing is often under marketing. But you see it more as just from the outbound channel perspective. And the ones that are going to learn from it <clears throat> are primarily product marketing, are going to take advantage of that inbound side of it. And they're the ones that are going to be doing the briefings and doing the presentations and can take the feedback and take action, make action on it. Yes. So that's where I think it belongs. That's where I think it's most successful. But it's not yeah. there very often. Uh, you know, it's interesting you say that. You're you're absolutely right. And one of the things that I have noticed about the most, uh, the, where I've had the best experiences as an analyst in terms of getting the information I need, um, you know, and having good dialogue and good um, rapport is has been better when it is in the product side, right? Yeah. And and I and I'll I'll point to UKG for this. Uh, as Mark Workday does this as well. And I don't know if you remember Kathy Nottingham. She was. Uh, a, a legendary uh, analyst relations lead. She she was uh, she built the program at Ultimate Software, uh, and she influenced some of the f leadership that is now at Workday. But they both uh, align it under their product marketing side yep. versus purely marketing or purely comms. And the, the the flow of information that comes across is much better. It's more succinct. It's it's clear, and they can go deeper with us. Yeah. Um, the product folks, right? The product owners versus the the frontline kind of, or, or excuse me, the high level sort of ivory tower marketing people yeah. who maybe are simply just writing about it, right? And so, yeah. yeah, I think there's a much better experience, there's a much better flow of information, and a much more clean. Um, less barriers to to dialogue between each other about what you're building and and answering our questions as analysts, which we know we all uh, push hard on on things that you know others are not going to ask, right? Yep. So, uh, yeah, and, yeah, very interesting. I think it's like self perception too. If you're part of yeah. comms, you're seeing yourself as a comms person. You're seeing yourself as light in content, right? You know, I'm not the expert on the content. These guys over there are the experts. I'm going to just arrange the briefings and you know, yeah. and take notes. And yes. when you're in product marketing, just because that's where you sit, you see your role much more strategically and deeper. And I think you have, because of where you sit, you can address AR differently, better. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the message comes across very watered down. I think when it, when it's, it's the further it gets away from the product team. Right. Uh, and it, and it gets very diluted and I, and I'll be honest with you as analysts, we, we cut right through that very quickly mm -hmm. as, as you probably know. Um, so you did a great show recently, um, on YouTube and I'm going to share this. Uh, I, I don't recall if this was your show, Robin, or if this was someone else's, but you talked about the concept of, uh, the inner, the sort of the, the intersection between AR and PR, yeah. right. Uh, yeah, that you know, uh, Yes, that was a great, great conversation. And, and, and the fact that they need to be working in concert, right? They're not the same thing. So could you talk a little bit about that and, and explain why that's important? Because I think that that's where you're right. When comms and PR are managing analyst relations, it is not the same experience as when marketing or product marketing right. is doing that, at least from my perspective as an analyst. And so what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, PR, how would I say it? pr -ifying. AR that happens. <laughs> yes. And the analysts really don't like it because PR yes. has a very different way of working. Yes. They, um, doesn't sit well with analysts that are, it's more transactional, frankly. And analyst relations is more on the relationship and building that relationship over time. And even though, you know, certainly PR has relationships, it's not the same. It's not the same. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, 
when PR and AR are siloed, it's really a wasted, big wasted opportunity because you can have, um, so first of all, P AR should be supporting every PR effort with analysts, right? So if you're putting out a press release, there should be an analyst that's brief, that knows the thing that can be referenced um, for PR outreach that should be quoted in the press release, all that good stuff. That's basic. That's table stakes. And I think most people do that. Uh, well, actually, I think a lot of people don't do that, but I think that's an easy thing to do. Um, but there's things like uh, PR is great at content and they can help um, they can help provide content to AR to feed analysts in a lot of cases if we need some of that content. And AR can analysts can really inform the PR people by them sitting on a briefing or getting notes and understanding the analyst perspective of the market and where the opportunities are. And if AR and, and, and then AR and PR have to be aligned in the message, what are we saying to the market? Um, and be consistent and, and have that, that support each other. So there's a lot of really good things that happen when there's a good, solid partnership between PR and AR. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. There, there's some very, uh, the messaging when it comes from PR, from the, from the PR side tends to be very fluffy and very yeah. watered down. And it, yeah, again, you, you get it straight from products. It's a whole different thing. Yeah, so, exactly. so look, uh, just, just to kind of round this out, Robin, I could, I could can keep asking you questions. Yeah. I promise you, you'd get tired, but, um, I want to talk about analyst etiquette, engagement etiquette, right? Yeah. I've got a few uh, pet peeves of mine, right? One of which is having PR people try and, you know, come and pitch these yeah. things to us. And it, and it is very watery. And you're like, okay, this isn't telling me anything right. that I can't read on the internet. Um, the other thing I, I personally am not a fan of, and I've, I coach my vendors all the time, particularly when they're doing briefings with other analysts is do not sell to analysts. You don't bring yeah. salespeople and don't come in here and pitch us. We're not buying and we're not investing. We need to learn about your product. Yeah. We need to be very under, we need to have a deep understanding and we need to know where you fit in the marketplace so that we can have an educated conversation with buyers uh, and others about what you're doing and where, you know, where it fits. Um, but what about any other sort of do's and don'ts that you would say? <laughs> two huge ones. I think yes, yes. A, a minor thing that people mistake, make a mistake all the time is trying to prove to one analyst that you're great by showing another analyst's data. Yes. <laughs> so, Hey, this analyst rated us really well, or this analyst, you know, said great things about us. Well, that doesn't play well. If you're talking to another analyst, don't ever do that. Yep. <laughs> um, so that's a big one. Um, I think a big mistake is uh, sharing. Well, I don't want to say sharing too much information, but um, not being focused and um, and careful in the way you communicate. So if you're doing a briefing for the first time with an analyst, you want to keep to fewer messages. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, tell them what you told them, the old adage. Keep it to three to five. What what do you really want them to remember, right? They're hearing yeah. briefings all day long and and people are trying to put, you know, 10 pounds of sausage in a three pound bag, right? <laughs> you can't do, they can't rush through slides and tell them everything you're going to tell them, right? You have to, uh, you know, give them information in a consumable way and let them leave them hungry for more, you know, and go back. And so I, I'm always like trying to pair people down, you know, get them, get them to, to say less and say it more effectively and clearer and, and more and stronger. Right. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, you know, in fact, I'm always like, I'm a proponent that end every presentation with takeaways. You know, what are the things, if the analyst remembers nothing else, get yourself to say three major, three to five major points that you want them to remember about you. And that yes. exercise, most vendors have no idea how to do that exercise. Like, yeah. oh, I have... 200 points. No, you have three points, three to five points to make about yourself. Get it down to those and, and put meat in it. Don't say we're the best at blah, 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 but give them some specifics that they can remember you by. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's uh, you're right. And there are a lot of firms that come in and really try to, you know, they want to they want to impress you. They want everyone to uh, to think they're the best thing, you know, since the last thing. Um, but, yeah, it's all about just being honest and open and transparent, I yeah. think, too, right. and, and really just working together to understand, to educate. Right. Just educate the analysts. Right. Help them help them understand you and help them help you is really what what it all boils and, and down strip, to. So strip your your presentation and your and your talk over out of best leading first unique only you know yes nobody wants yes. to hear that they want to the marcoms the keep the pr out of it <laughs> yeah they want to see the proof they want to know if you're going to say something like that they're going to first say, they're going to first argue with you you know you're not the first you're not the best you're not the lead don't give them that you know ammunition yeah if you're if you feel you really truly are you want to give them the data yeah the data yeah i love it Yep, absolutely. So Julie, uh, look, anything that you would add here to kind of round out what we've been talking about? I know we've been really hitting on the vendor side of this. Any buyer POVs that you'd kind of add to this in terms of just, you know, the way buyers should or shouldn't be engaging these or your, your viewpoint from from that perspective? Yeah, you know, I would just say this is fascinating conversation. And I really hope that buyers also are listening to this conversation because yes. it really is a whole ecosystem. It, there's a there's a, a lot of intricate activity that goes into uh, the relationship between analysts and the providers that produces these snippets of data that buyers are looking for. Yep. And I don't know that all buyers really appreciate the fact that um, service providers engage with analysts as a as a serious investment, right? I mean, they should if they're successful, yeah. right? Yeah. They're you know not only are they investing their time and their effort to bring research to get to those you know concise messages to share new things and to have that relationship, but they're also oftentimes you know investing dollars in you know subscriptions to see what they're saying about everybody or from the park product marketing side of the house where you know just even being able to reprint or reuse uh, you know one of the best known providers you know um snippet about you has a fee from one to the other and i, I just don't think that's commonly um understood mm -hmm. in the buyer community and so all of that said, you know, the, the, the buyers, you know, they just want to be aware of who's who, you know, in the market. And I, and I suspect that an HR buyer and a procurement buyer might have different needs, right? Or different point of views when they're trying to get to the end result of the analyst's work and, and knowledge. Uh, and so they might want to access some more reports, but, um, but I don't think often enough, I'd love to know from you guys' experience, how often do you have buyers engaging through, let's say, kind of the subscription models or whatever the different models are to have those broader context conversations? Service providers, I think, do it all the time because that's part of doing this well. But, um, you know, actually getting buyers to engage and uh, with the analyst directly uh, is, I think, just a harder you know, a harder see, you notch. See the buyers, I mean, my experience is you see the buyers concentrated in two areas, the big, the big two, Forrester and Gartner, and then the boutique firms that offer that buy side advisory and that not all do, mm -hmm. right? And yep. they can go to a specific um, firm that ex that's an expert in HCM and do their questions without, um, ask their questions and read the research without being, you know, kind of overwhelmed by the very, very large firms. They can really zero in on what they're interested in. But I yeah, think, absolutely. I see that the the Fortune, you know, one thousand, the biggest vendors all use the analysts. I think they underuse them. Because mm -hmm, one thing mm -hmm. to invest in it, another thing to really take advantage, it's kind of what I said before, take advantage of the research, take advantage of the inquiry time and use yep. it to help your business. And I don't think enough people do that. Yeah, it, no, I agree. it's a, I agree. you're right. It is very mixed. And uh, yeah, I have a lot of great buyer conversations and I, I make a lot of content for buyers and, and, and work uh, with vendors uh, in my advisory. So I, I don't advise buyers to the extent of doing sourcing advisory. I'll definitely do work with them uh, to help them understand the market and, and access things. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're right. I, I think buyers need to uh, look to the analysts as also a channel for helping them make decisions and um, helping them understand the marketplace and how to think about the solutions that they're looking to target. So uh, all very good, very good stuff. So Robin, just to kind of round things out, what are some key resources maybe that you would, you would point to? I know you've got a ton and I want to, I want to make sure before we wrap up that we hit on those, but, but otherwise, any other resources out there that you would say, 
tell marketing leaders or, or, or vendor leaders uh, or even buyers to, to maybe go and tap into that you feel like are really good for, for analyst uh, engagement, analyst relations? Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly the, the material that I am involved with, the book, um, yeah. which uh, the second edition is coming out. And the, um, we have a week, uh, not weekly, a um, video interview series, myself and uh, my, my partner in crime, Chris Holscher. Um, do a interview series on YouTube about analyst relations. So I have to say that the reason I bring those up first is because we saw gaps in the resources available, you know, yeah. to to people, and we built these things to um, to fill those in. There are certain a, a couple of books out there, up and to the right, and um, uh, it's another book, uh, influence the influencers. Those are, are books that people can get to. There is an uh, organization, two organizations I can mention, the IIAR, the International, the Influen Influencers and Analyst Relations or something. I think that's what it's called. Yes, for. yes. That's I'll the, put a link to that. That's a group. And then there's a new, a brand new group for analysts, uh, analyst relations called uh, Analyst Relations Association, which I can get you the URL to to put in the show notes. And they're another source for getting um, information on how to do AR really well. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I'll, I'll make sure we give those links. If you could share them with me, I'll pop them in our, our description. And, you know, look, Robin, this has been so, so great. I really appreciate you. I, I'm sure we could almost do another episode it possibly, and maybe we will at some point, but uh, where can everyone find you, right? You mentioned your book, uh, your website, oh, yeah. may, you know, tell us where all we can find you and I'll make sure these are all, if you could share them with sure. me, I'll make sure they're in the description too. My, uh, my, my website, Schaefer, uh, A-R-S-C-H-A-F-F-E-R, A-R. Dot com and we'll put that in the notes and then um my email which i'm very happy to always entertain conversation i love chewing on these things with people is simply robin at shaperar.com got it perfect and you're i believe you're on um linkedin as well right I under am. robin okay. Schaefer. yep yeah and your uh your book where do we find your book well uh the current book is on amazon um the new book uh, i would say wait till um September and it's going to be on there. We'll promote it on that website and I'll, I'm very active in social in, in LinkedIn. So you'll find it. In Perfect. There. Feel free to connect with me anytime. Absolutely. What's the title uh, of that? It's called analysts on analyst relations. Got it. Beautiful. We will make sure we get all the links. See if you'll uh, share those with me. That's beautiful. Julie, where are you going to be? What's uh, what's going on with you? You know, it's summertime and summertime yeah. is the very heart of a lot of heavy client lifting around um, transformation. So a lot of folks are aiming for go lives at the end of the year and maybe they're a little late starting or, or they're deep in the thick of it. And so until the fall, I'm spending most of my time with uh, clients or with providers and clients that are engaging in some really exciting transformation activity. That's yeah. Awesome. Very good. Well, I've got a long list. Uh, this weekend, I don't know if this episode, I think this episode will be go up, going up next week, but I'll be at the Atlanta Pay Org uh, chapter picnic. They're doing a school supply drive here in Atlanta. So we're going to get together and uh, have some burgers and probably throw a football around and uh, help some kids get some school supplies. Um, so shout out to them for, for putting that together. Um, Daily Pay and I are doing a panel on responsible earned wage access usage on July 24th at noon. Uh, so look for that. You can see that on my channels as well as Daily Pays. Uh, Payslip and I have a report um, that we're putting out. It's coming out next week. Actually, Julie, I've given you a sneak peek of that already. Um, and that is uh, something I did jointly between Payslip and the Global Payroll Management Institute. So look for that uh, to come up soon. And then eventually we're going to do a webinar on that. And of course, we're hoping to have uh, Fidelma McGurk from Payslip on the show in, in the coming weeks here to talk about that report. Uh, I've also got a blog coming out on Safeguards Chat SG, which we just talked about earlier today. And you can certainly find that over at gxcadvisors.com. Uh, and then, of course, I've got the Magellan AI Mixer coming up here in Atlanta as well. Uh, in Buckhead on July 26 at 6 p.m., we're going to be doing that at South City Kitchen. I'll be kicking off a uh, conversation with multinational buyers uh, and a few um, of the EOR uh, or workforce solution providers here as well. So I'm really looking forward to uh, to that evening. So lots going on this summer, even though it's summer. <laughs> <laughs> A lot going on. Yeah. You're busy. I know. 
<laughs> well, look, Robin, thank you so very much. It's been amazing as always. And Julie, of course, uh, you, you know, I appreciate you as well. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.